What's up fools, how's it going? Welcome to another video. Today we're gonna talk about the very beginning of Blender. How you can start so you can make great art like this. So I've started with Blender around two, three months ago, so it's very recent, but I feel like even as a beginner, I can give you great beginner tips because I ran into lots of trouble. And I feel like you don't have to if I explain to you what you have to do to not do that. So let's start with the beginning, starting Blender. So usually when you start Blender, what you see is a cube and a camera and a light. But here comes the first thing. Usually when I watch tutorials, everybody starts with deleting the cube, but why don't you just set it up the way that you don't even have the first cube to delete? So I started doing that. So I set up my scene there where there was like nothing going on. It was completely empty, but that wasn't great either. So I went through like all those settings and everything what I needed for every single setup. So eventually I made my own little startup setup and now I'm going to help you to figure out how you can set up your first setup and for this i have like a little cheat sheet um, because i couldn't remember um every time when i started a new blender scene what i had to do so i wrote it all down um but keep in mind everything what i have set up it's not necessarily what you need but maybe it's going to give you an idea of what you need again i'm a beginner myself and um, this is from noob to noob here so let's see what we got here the first thing I do is I select in the scene options here, I select cycles. Usually it's on Eevee, but cycles usually just looks better from the get go. Um, so I always set this to cycles on um, device. I say GPU, uh, GPU compute. And then the next one is the denoiser. Very important. And the most recent uh, blenders, they have a denoiser, which works very good. Um, so we have one for the viewport, one the noiser for, for the render. It's two different things. So for the viewport is what we see up here. This is our viewport render. It looks like this. There is no lights right now. So that's why it looks like this. But uh, the one for the render, when I hit here on render, render, render image or render animation, I'm going to actually get what I actually get in the end. And for that, I have the, the, the noiser um on my render and in the beginning i keep it on 0.1 the one for the viewport just on one the lower the number the better the image is going to look but the longer the render is going to take so while i'm working on something i have it on 0.1 if i want to do the final render i set it up to 0 0.01 but this is crazy this this only the best computers can do that mine can't i have a pretty old computer so i usually am like 0.06 or even i leave it on 0.1 depending on how big the scene is and sometimes i just don't want to wait for like a whole week for something to render but if something is very important like a, for a film or so and it has to look good then i always keep it on zero um zero one there we go and also very important to mention optics is the one we want to use for both okay and this is very important that you select that next one is path guiding just click it on i don't know what it does but it looks better and it's faster light tree click it on next one is a big one it's very important it's the light pass what it basically does is it gives blender the information how many passes and light reflections and transparency and all of these things how many do you want i set everything to two until my actual scene is done so then i know how many how much glass do i have so it has to be more transparent how much uh, fog do i have so the volume has to be higher so all these things you select in the end the total is for what threshold do you want to go to like even if i set this to let's say 27 it's never gonna go over 10 so that's the idea behind it 
if I don't have any fog or smoke or anything like that in my scene, I set this to zero. And you want to keep those numbers as small as possible because every time when you increase the number, even if you don't have those things, like if you don't have glass in your scene and you set it, set it to 21, it's still going to go through more passes and it's going to take longer to render. So you want to keep those numbers small, as, as small as possible, as big as necessary. Speaking of glass, if you don't use any glass in your scene, I always set fast GI approximation, uh, click it on. If I do use glass or water or liquid, I always turn it off. So then I have some optional settings for you. When you click on your camera or you make a new camera, I like to use this fish eye look because it just you can you can see it here. Um, when you go on cycles, I like to use this fish eye look, and then you have to increase the field of view to not have any dark spots. But that just feels more real. You don't have to do that. I think also it increases the render time. If you don't want this, usually it's set to perspective. That's the normal one. Um, then you just set your focal length. You can also go like wide angle or like long lens. But this fish eye look just looks very interesting. And yeah, what you have to do is set it to panoramic, fish eye, and then you're good to go. Another thing I like to do is set it, turn on the depth of field. Usually I do it in the end when I know what I want to have in focus. And then I set my depth of field. And here either you measure the focus distance, like just like with a regular camera. I have the focus distance on like half a meter right now. If I wanted something like in the background in focus, I would have it like three meters. And that's basically what it is here. Or you can also select an object and just set that in focus automatically. But more about that later. Another important one in the camera settings, we see this little guy here. It's called Pus Part 2. I don't even know how to pronounce it. That basically makes the everything out of frame invisible, which is a little easier to work with if you ask me if you look through the camera. If you don't look, look through the camera, if you just look around, then you don't see that. But if you look through the camera, you see everything around is black. This is what Pus Part 2 does, and I usually increase it to 100. And that's basically it from my little cheat sheet. I'm going to write it also in the description if you want to do that too. But again, it really depends on your settings and your needs, everything you want. And then when you're done, um, I'm just going to look through my tabs up here and see what's important. I have like layout. This is layout is the one I usually use. And here I set up uh, my UVs. Here my note editor. So if I have like materials, I see those down here. I have my timeline um, and you can set it up the way you want so it really is whatever you want and I have like two viewports one usually I have just th for my camera what my camera sees and here's what, what I what I play around with I also have a motion tracking tab I just add it in there you can add more workspaces if you click on this little plus button and I added one for motion tracking because this is something I do a lot because I mostly work on visual effects so sometimes or very often i have to have a shot throw it in there and motion track it and that's why i have this motion tracking tab always there and then when you think you're done that this is your setup you always going to need so delete your cube instead of a cube i have Mihal here um for me this is better as a default setup not because i want to use him every time but he's great as a placeholder so when i import models or I do build something, I always want to have it to scale. So I, if I build a house and suddenly it's just super tiny, then I know, hey, Miha is huge next to him, uh, not next to the house. That's not what I want. So when I build something, I want to have it always in scale. That's why I have Miha here. And in the end, I usually either I just turn off this little button, so I still see him in the viewport, but when I render, then he's not going to be there. And this is what this button is for. This one is the other way around. This is everything in the viewport. But this is a dangerous game, let me tell you. Because sometimes you, you click him off and you do something and then you render. But it's still turned off here. So it's still going to appear in the final render, but not in the viewport. So this is something to keep in mind. Usually I turn these things off when I have a liquid simulation and lots of stuff is going on. Then I turn it off only in the viewport so I still can work without my computer slowing down. And now, finally. If you think you're done and everything is set up, you go on File, Defaults, and Save Startup File. 
And then every time we start Blender, it's gonna start from that. A few things I recommend uh, if you're like a beginner Blender person, some things I always use are some plugins which are already installed on in Blender, but you just have to turn them on. One big one is import images as planes. What you do with that is when you make, make a new plane, you can import a plane as an image, images as plane. So I can go download and you can have a video or a photo, whatever you want. You can just have it as a plane, which is very, very handy. Every time we shoot someone on green screen or so, this is how I import those people. So I just grabbed a random screenshot I had. I don't know what I was using for, but now I have this here and you know this is how you can put things into your scene very simple okay now our scene is set up and what do we do with this now well blender is great for so many things you can do 3d modeling you can do animation you can do anything what to what has to do with 3d you can do it in here and you can't learn it all this is something you have to realize that just modeling is a full-time job you have to do for five or ten years to be very very good at it so if modeling something for you then go for it um or if animation is something uh, for you you have to learn how how work, uh, bones work and uh, how to animate those properly and then you have to get into that so you you can do all this in within one software but my recommendation is focus on the things you really need to do and get better at that and just learn the basics of everything else for example you see this here this on the left this is his texture i wouldn't be able to make this also on this guy is 3d scan so it looks different too but i wouldn't be able to texture someone and i don't think i will ever be but i also uh, know that i have to figure out how the basics work in, in case i have to change something let's say i have his face here but I don't want him to have a beard and this is where I would clean up his beard like in Photoshop or so so I kind of have have to have an idea how texturing works even though this is not my main profession or like how modeling works I wouldn't be able to model this guy but what I would be able to you know when I start fresh by the way shortcut for making something new is shift a go to mesh usually you start with the Q and if you the, the basics of modeling you still have to nail like how do i move an object i hit g now i can move it okay but to only move it in in a certain space for example i want to move it only left and right on the y x then i hit g first and then y so i can't move it anywhere besides on the y x same thing with um the x x i can go back and forth but i can't go left and right anymore same thing with g and v i can go up and down now which is very very handy and now now i have this cube here and now i have to figure out what do what, what do i want to do with, with this cube if i want to learn how to do basic modeling i could just grab whatever i have here this here for example and then I figure out, okay, how do I model this? You know, I don't even, I'm not even worried about the material for now. Just how would I make this? Okay, what shape is it close to? Is it maybe a cube? Not really, it's too round for a cube. I guess I could start with a cube, but I think I'm gonna start, I don't know, let's say with a cylinder. Shift A, mesh, and now I am gonna go to the cylinder. Bringing up, bringing right, right next to him, obviously this guy, this this mug would be like the size of my Mihal here, but um, eventually I'm going to scale it, scale it down because I don't want it to be this size. So I now I have the cylinder here, so what, what do I need? So I guess I don't need this here, it has to be open, so I'm going to go to edit mode to manip manipulate that. Edit mode, either you click an object and then edit mode, but also when you hit tab, you go from object mode to edit mode, which is very handy. Now, the next thing you have to know is what can you actually manipulate? I can manipulate 
these little bad boys. But I can also manipulate these bad boys. Those are edges. Or, what is this? Faces. See that? And you can also select those with the button 1, see, 2, and 3. Shortcuts are very important for editing in general, so you can get through things faster. Now, for example, let, let's say I want to see this object exactly from the side. I click on 1 on the, on the right side where the numbers are, you know. And then the 3, if I wanted to see from the front, 2 will give me like a, like a diagonal angle. But usually the most you're going to need is 1, 3, and 7 is top view. And 9 is bottom view. So those are the three things. So now if I wanted to model this, I go to face mode. This is the, the face. And just hit X. Usually you delete with the backspace button, but um, in, in Blender you delete with the X button. This is very important. And I just delete the face. Now it's hollow. Now I can look inside. So you see, we're getting like already closer to to this thing. Now I gotta figure out. Okay, it goes wider. It goes wider here, and then it goes back in. And now I need to figure out. Okay, how do I do this? And I would never know how to do this if I didn't practice. It's just by playing around, watching tutorials. This is how you learn. Um, still. I'm not an expert. It's like everything I do, there's like a right way and a wrong way to do it. But for me, as long as I get to to the end results, I'm happy. So I'm just gonna start with Control R. That gives me like an edge loop, so I can create more edges. And I'm just gonna start with one. And now I click and I can move it down. Let me go to side view so I see better. Okay, now. I can scale it with S. Scale it up or scale it down. You see on my, on my screen what was happening. Now the bottom has to be flatter than, than the top. Right now this here and this here is the same size. But the bottom is a little um, thinner. So with holding Alt and clicking on this here. Now I can scale the bottom. And now see we're already getting closer to this. It's obviously still not perfect. So, click Alt again. Maybe I can just bevel this with a right click. It's also Control B, I believe. Bevel edges, Control B. So now I can make this rounder. Oh, one more thing. When you want to select everything, keep in mind you're selecting only from one side. The other side is not selected. To change that, you go here in the X-ray mode. So you know everything is selected. I scale it down, but now I want to scale it up a little to make it longer. So I hit S and then Z to make it just a little longer. Yeah, I'm not gonna make a perfect thing here now. Just I'm just trying to do that just so you get an idea what I'm doing. Like what I did before, L, and I'm gonna, and now we're gonna use the um, shortcut, Control B. Just to make this a little rounder. Cool. Object mode, this is what it looks like. One important thing is, when you right click and shade smooth, it always smooths the edges, which is cool. And now, another problem is, I don't know if you're gonna be able to see that, but it's completely thin, it's like paper. But this here is not like paper, you see? It's a little thick. And there is a modifier. And uh, with a the modifier, and there's lots of different modifiers. And I'm not going to go through all of, of those. But two or three modifiers I use like all the time. One is Array. One is Solidify. And one is uh, the Subdivision Surface. Those I use like all the time. Um, I'm just going to go through what they all do. An array it basically creates a copy and I can tell Blender how many copies I want for now it's 12 I can adjust the, the distance and whatnot and this is very uh, handy when for example I have a street and I have street lights and I don't want to position each one individually then I would just do that 
But the problem is I can't manipulate them uh, individually. And it's all one object. So this is something to keep in mind. Another one is uh, subdivision surface. And basically gives my, my objects more, uh, more polygons. And I can select how many I want. So five, five. and to make it rounder, for example. So this, that's what uh, subdivision surface is for. There's also one for bevel, what I did before here. Uh, to make the edges rounder, I could also do them with the modifier and bevel. But what I'm using now is the solidify. And what that is for, if I want to make it thicker. So I have the thickness here, see? Now it has some depth so now I can see what that looks like and I'm kind of trying to estimate the same thickness oh another good shortcut for you when you adjust those things and uh, you just can't get it right because it's you know, it's moving too fast if you hold shift it slows down and you can work more precisely okay now I have this object obviously I want it to be the size of my guy here that's why, why this is helpful to have a little Miho here because I can see, see, okay, this is kind of the size of my hand, a little smaller. So I'm going to make this um, approximately the same size. That's why it's nice to have a little Mihal here. I say little, he's actually huge. He's like seven feet tall or so. But yeah, if I have my object here, by the way, another cool shortcut. It's a little Dell dot button on the, on the right side. If you push this, it's going to zoom into your object, which is very neat. So for example, I'm working on a huge scene and then I'm looking for my little um, mug here. I can just click on this, go back with my mouse to the viewport, hit the button and zooms in. Very cool. So now I have my little thing here, but now it still looks pretty pale. It's not very interesting. So I need to give it a material. And I kind of look at this. What does it look like? It looks, I'm going to give it a base color, like a gray. And for that, it's also practical to be here in the, in the shading editor because you have different views. This is wireframe. And the more right you go, the, the more computer intensive it's going to go. So uh, you want to keep it, more, uh, if you can, away from the cycles because this is gonna, always going to take longer to render, you see. Only if you actually have to see what it looks like with the lighting and everything because here the lighting doesn't change. It's just what the material looks like. So now I'm gonna, I can play around with the materials. Uh, I see it has some roughness on it, but it's also a little shiny. So I'm gonna go metallic up. If I go metallic 100%, roughness zero. This is gonna give me a mirror, but I don't want a mirror. But this is still very reflective. You can see how it reflects the light. So I'm kind of trying to simulate that. And again, this is like something textures do. Like this is the bread and butter and I have absolutely no idea what I'm doing so um, I will not give you like a tutorial on how to give something the material but this is what I'm trying to do here in this video is that you have to um, know how these things work because even if you just model something you give this model to someone he ha it has to be a set up a certain way that he knows how to um, you know texture it and you know, give materials to it but that for like very rough, it looks pretty cool, right? And now, for example, let's, let's give it some light so we actually see what we're doing here. So I'm gonna make another plane first, just so we have a ground layer. The ground layer, you know what? I'm gonna, just gonna give it the same, same material. Also, it's good to name your materials so you know what it, what it is. I always forget that, but it's very important. Um, so we have a little ground layer and now Either we can set up some lights with Shift A, very important. When you go to lights and you know, let's give them a sunlight. Right, the sunlight here. I'm gonna rotate it towards him. So now when we look through cycles, we see there is a light going on. But if you don't want to or if lighting is not something you're into, eventually you have to figure out. But you can always, um, instead of messing with all that, you can always just download an HDRI. I use Blender Kit 
I believe it's for free, but I'm not sure. And I have lots of HRIs in here already, so I can just drag and drop it in here. And now suddenly I have a whole realistic lit room. That makes it very easy to light something without knowing what you're doing. Um, and it still looks real because this photo around, it is a real photo. So it always makes your objects look more real than uh, if you light it yourself. Okay, now, oh, one good one. You see how this is floating right now? Let me go to this area. It's not attached. There's this cool snapping tool. And if you use that with um, face pro project, and now when I try to move it, it automatically snaps to the ground. See, and now I try to look through. You can't, it's like snapped to the ground, which is very cool. So now I can move it around and it's always gonna be snapped to whatever object is closest. Very helpful. But now this cool thing, okay. That's basically the basics of Blender. Now to just have something more interesting than that, I'm just gonna set up my little camera. Here I'm looking through the camera already. If you don't want to look through the camera when you move, for example, if your camera is not supposed to move anymore, when you hit N and go to view, you can click this off, camera to view. And now when I move the camera, this camera is actually gonna stay there. But if I actually want to position my camera, by the way, with the button zero on the right, you can go into the camera, out of the camera. So now I turned this on. Now when I move the camera, you can see it here. This is my camera. It actually moves around. So I can position my camera the way I want. So I'm gonna go to my camera settings. Always when you wanna get into the camera settings, you have to click on your cameras first. Camera settings, and now I have this fish eye thing. Go through cycles because cycles always looks different so i'm going to set up this little angle here see how slow it renders but now i can in my camera settings depth of field is on i'm going to click on this little thing and i want my little cylinder to be in focus but the focus the depth of field is too shallow so i'm just gonna it's just like over with a regular camera with the f-stop when you go on f-stop 23 then everything is more in focus if you go uh lower then less is going to be in focus um the difference is here in blender and with a regular camera if you go higher here you get more light into the, in the lens and it's going to get brighter we have the um we're lucky here that this doesn't happen so we can adjust our depth of field the way we want. So now I have this cool, whatever looking shot. This guy, we can turn him. This is something I forgot earlier. We have G for moving, right? Let me go in, in this view. G for moving, snapping is still on. We have S for scaling. By the way, if you don't want to actually do this action you can do right click then it's going to snap back but also we have r for rotation and if you rotate just like this it's going to rotate on your axle where you're looking through if you hit r and z it's going to rotate around the z x r and y it's going to rotate around the um, y x so you can do backflips and rotate x around the x x you can do side flips but in that case we want to you know what let's turn him away from the camera and now when we look through this again we have this badass looking shot you know something i should have mentioned before you rotate around your environment with the middle button and then you zoom in and zoom out with your mouse wheel with the left click can select objects with the right click you can go some different options about the object so now we have this cool looking shot i don't know what it is 
But one last thing, I know th this has been already way longer tutorial than I meant to do, but one last thing, when you go into your node um, editor, you can click on world, and this is where my HDRI is, and I can rotate it if, if I want to have the lighting differently. I see what I like. I like this, that he's being, being lit from left and right, and there's probably something going on behind us. But uh, yeah, that looks pretty cool. So this is our shot now. So when I render this, let's double check in my render settings. The denoiser. Yeah, and this would take probably too long. Let's do 0.5. Again, the lower the number, the um, long it's going to take, but the better it's going to look. Now when I go and render image, you can always render an image or an animation. Now I can actually see what it is going to look like when it's finally finalized rendered. And here we see the time, I see it frame one, the time, how long it's taking, how long it's going to take. But um, this number is not always right. So sometimes it says like 36 minutes, but then suddenly it's just done. In general, if you want to render an animation, you go here to the output properties. Here you select your, um, your size, your res resolution. This is full HD right now. If you want to go higher, you can go higher. If you want to go lower, you can always just decrease the percentage. It's kind of cool. Here is the frame rate. I usually render everything 24 frames unless I shoot something in 23.9 and whatnot. Then I change that to that. Here, the beginning and ending of the animation. Right now, I don't have an animation. I just have an image. So I, I don't need this. I usually uh, render an art RGBA, this is uh, red, green, blue, and alpha in a PNG sequence. So in the end, you're gonna get like lots of different images of your different uh, shots, um, different frames basically. And, uh, and here, very important, you select your uh, file output where it's gonna go to. And this is what you do here. Okay, we have our final image, and now. That's basically it. And then I can go through After Effects or Premiere and you know color grade it and whatnot. But again, this is just the basics. If um, I wanted to animate my camera movement, I click on my camera, and then I'm, I'm in my um, graph editor. I'm going to make this into a timeline. So if I want to animate my camera movement, either I click here on this um, auto keying. If I position it here, then it's going to be there. And then I go 10 frames later, or 20 frames later, and move this camera. Let's do it in top view. Move this camera to the left. I also rotate it to my, towards my guy. So those keyframes are now automatically done. So now I have a camera movement. It's very fast, and I don't like how close it gets here. So I have now have three keyframes. Very fast. I don't like it. You can just if you just scale your um, keyframes, they're just gonna move apart. This is the cool thing. So now I have a camera movement animated. If I didn't want to do this uh, auto keying, which can be very distracting, sometimes you animate things you didn't want to animate. You turn this back off, and when you go to your item, you see this is all yellow now. But let's say I, I want to animate him in just this rotation. I hover over this, hit I. Now and there's a keyframe here. Now I'll go a different keyframe. I change his rotation. Now it's orange. That means I changed something, but it's not animated yet. Then I hit I again. And now I look at it. He's turning now. You see this? All right. I know that was a lot, but... Um, I feel like after you watch those 30 minutes or whatever that video was long, that should give you a pretty good idea of all the things you can do in Blender. Like there's obviously so much more. There's fluid animations, uh, simulations, you can make fire, explosions, you can have monsters. But all of that in future videos, this video is basically what I learned in three months within a nutshell. So. If you have any questions, please let me know, because again, I'm a noob too, so we're learning together, basically. 
So thank you so much for watching. If you're interested in watching my short films and definitely my reels where I use all those blender techniques, definitely check them out and see you in the next video. Toodle-doo. Ah.